Good morning. In the late 1950s, a young Charles Frazier had a vision for the property his family owned on Hilton Head Island. During the next decade, Frazier's passion and power as a storyteller helped transform that vision into reality. In the process, Frazier also helped create a culture for Hilton Head. When we look at Harbortown Lighthouse, Sea Pines Nature Preserve, or the network of bicycle paths that cross the island. All of these are legacy parts for Fraser. To understand how Fraser had such an impact, I introduced to you what I call the community culture paradigm. Fraser understood that vision and culture interacted in a positive feedback loop and that it was the storytellers telling the right stories that added energy and power to this positive feedback loop. While many of Frazier's legacy items on the island, such as the bike path, still exist, there were some parts of his original vision that did not work. Some of these were due to unintended consequences, but some were lessons learned about how local governments operate. Our question today is, can lessons from Charles Fraser's legacy help Hilton Head plan for its future? Fraser's legacy extends well beyond the boundaries of Hilton Head because in the process of developing sea ponds, he was also training the next generation of community developers who repeated Fraser's stories and in the process reaffirmed his vision. Taking the lessons learned from Frazier, two of his protégés, Jim Chafin and Jim Light, developed a master plan for Spring Island, which is located between Bluffton and Buford. They appreciated how special this place was, and so their goal was to create a place where people could live and the special features that made Spring Island special be preserved. Their idea was to have a community within a nature park, thereby protecting the cultural and natural beauty of the place. This would include nature would dominate even the, net, the home sites on the island. Remembering back to a lesson where Fraser found out that some of the areas that he had set aside for nature preserves and sea pines were later developed by the community association, Betsy Chafin, Jim Chafin's wife, who had had over a decade of experience with community uh, nonprofits, recommended that on Spring Island, a nonprofit should own the nature preserves. And that nonprofit should have its own source of funding. That nonprofit became the Spring Island Trust. In 1998, I was hired to become the executive director of the Spring Island Trust. And one of the first things that happened was that I learned Fraser's stories from the Chafins. And it was Frazier's vision that helped shape how I worked with the trust. The Spring Island Trust has its own governing board that works in partnership with the Spring Island Property Owners Association, but it's not under it. The two major purposes of the trust on Spring Island are to wisely manage the natural resources and also to educate both the people who live there and work there. For example, this includes educating the landscapers who work for the homeowners as well as the homeowners themselves. The staff of the trust are the storytellers who introduce the new residents to the culture of Spring On through the stories they tell them. The leadership on Spring Island, the boards of the POA and the trust institutionalized the Spring Island vision for future leaders by developing and putting on the website both a Spring Island philosophy and a list of core values. So when it came to Spring Island, with the community culture PO, uh, uh, paradigm, what we have is both the leadership of the PO and the trust maintaining this positive feed feedback loop of the vision and the culture whereas the trust staff are the storytellers that continue to tell the stories, which also reinforce that culture. 
The early leaders of the Spring Island community, however, also recognized that to maintain the special sense of place of Spring Island, they had to protect the salt marshes and tidal rivers that surrounded the island. With that in mind, the Spring Island Trust, through its sister organization, the Low Country Institute, partnered with Clemson Extension to create the Master Naturalist Program, the first one for the state. In this program, residents from throughout the Low Country come to learn the important nature stories, and in the process, they turn around and tell these stories to others. In addition, Tony Mills, our education director, partnered with Rob Lewis at the Beaufort County TV channel to produce Coastal Kingdom. Listen as Tony tells one of the most important nature stories about our area. Port Royal Sound is a marriage of ocean and land, a relationship created by a combination of rising sea level, extremely high tides, and unique geology. This ecosystem was created when rising sea levels submerged valleys along the coast. The result is Port Royal Sound, a marine habitat that extends inland for over 20 miles. Since our tides average eight and a half feet and we get minimal freshwater inflow, our salinity is influenced by tidal waters from the ocean, not freshwater from the uplands. Massive oyster rakes colonize our flats. These shellfish reefs filter our waters and provide a safe place for marine creatures to feed and hide. Spartina grass is the basis of our marine food web. As the grass decays, the waters become turbid with detritus giving the smallest marine organisms a rich source of nutrients. These plankton provide plenty of food for crabs, shrimp, and a high diversity of fish species. So the goal of these two programs is to create a large army of storytellers who help promote the culture of protection of the environment with all the people that they encounter. So how does this apply to Hilton Head? Hilton Head has, what about its stories? What about its storytellers? Like Spring Island, to protect the marine environments around Hilton Head requires protecting all the land that's within this yellow line. What happens on the land impacts the Port Royal Sound. And the quality of the Port Royal Sound determines the quality of life on Hilton Head. For example, let's see what's ha been happening on the mainland. Here's an area within the Okatee area in 1994. Follow what happens within these three circles. Here it is in 1999. Here it is in 2006. Stormwater runs off pavement and roofs, and so the more Stormwater coming off this environment uh, runs into the nearby salt marshes. This not only changes the water chemistry, it can actually change the structure of the salt marsh itself by channelizing the tidal creeks. Crustaceans are the key to the food web in the Port Royal Sound because they represent the major food source for our populations of sports fish. So through stormwater, what happens on the land affects our quality of life. The Port Royal Sound Foundation was created to help be one of the storytellers to help everyone know this story. There are many stories to be told about Hilton Head that are important to its culture. Coastal Discovery Museum, St. Helena Foundation, the Mitchellville Foundation Project. All of these are important. So Hilton Head has many good stories, important stories, and storytellers that relate to the culture. The challenge now is, going forward, as Hilton Head looks at revisiting its vision, it's important to recognize the close interconnection between vision and culture, stories, and storytellers, because this gives the community resilience as we face a time of rapid impending growth or the next cataclysmic event that may occur. With these, we can survive all of these. Thank you.